So real quick, uh, I'm Mark Lovell. This is Ryan Moran. Uh, together, for the last four or five years, we've been doing uh, lots of tournaments together. Uh, we're out of the Dayton, Ohio area, not too far from here. So we fish a lot of lakes, a lot of uh, canal lakes and shallow lakes, uh, flood control lakes, deep lakes, uh, uh, gravel pit, quarry lakes, kind of a combination of all sorts of different lakes. And I know every area around the country has different types of lakes. And one of the things that we focused on was uh, figuring out how to catch a lot of channel fish. And the reason we started doing that was because I had a bad stretch fishing tournaments in the Ohio River. I went a couple of years, I could hardly catch I mean, I'm just throwing my money away. And uh, there were some, some lake tournaments close to my house, and I started just diving right in, figuring out what, what I was going to do and how to do it. And uh, over those last five or six years, we got pretty good at it. We won a ton of tournaments, won a lot of money. Um, we've kind of come up with our own lids and our own style of how we do it. We have a good rhythm together, uh, like all partners. I do certain things in the boat, Ryan does certain things in the boat, everything works well. And that's, that's half the battle. But I'm going to go through, we're going to talk about it. I got a bunch of slides. <coughs> so, uh, alright, let's go ahead and go to this. Talk about the agenda, talk about the intro, uh, and talk about what dragging is, what do you need to do it. Uh, rigging and boat control are two of the really key issues that will make you go from floating aimlessly across the lake to catch a bunch of fish. Uh, dragging is a great process. Uh, I cannot tell you how many days we've caught 60, 70, 80 catfish in eight hours. I mean, you can just burn up the channel fat. When you find them, they're on fire all through the summer. Uh, they're really active you can just catch a ton of fish, whether you're looking for fish from the freezer or whatever. All right, now we'll talk about boat control, we'll talk about uh, trolling versus drag, and we'll talk about that. The when and where, some tips, and then at the end we'll take some questions. So we'll just move along. All right, what is drag? The art of utilizing the wind or trolling motor, pull bottom, bouncing baits across the lake bottom to cover as much water as possible. I just tried to come up with what I thought it was. So um, the part where you talked about. Covering as much water as much as possible, that's key because that's how you find fish. You know, if you go out in the boat, you shore, you throw out, you're stuck in that area. You know, but in this case, we may drift. You know, if the wind is blowing half a mile an hour, if, you know, if, you know, if the wind's blowing half a mile an hour and we drift for an hour, we just cover, you know, half a mile of water, a stretch, you know, 25 foot wide. That's, that's a lot of lake bottom you're going to find some fish. And a whole day, we may drift eight miles. Think about that. Eight miles of a lake, you know, 20, 25 foot wide. I don't know what the square footage is, but that's a ton. Of and that's how you find fish. All right. Don't glue in here to equipment they need. Typically, this, obviously, this is a boat thing. I have friends that do it from canoes. I have friends that do this rig, this setup from kayaks. A lot of guys are doing it from kayaks right now. And as long as you're in something that floats across the top of the water, you can do this rig. All right, trolling motor. Um, if you go out on windy days, you don't really need a trolling motor because typically we drift the boat sideways with the wind. We talked about that. Uh, so really, a trolling motor is optional, but a lot of times, you will show up at the lake early in the morning, it's flat as glass. You know what? You're not going to drift anywhere. <laughs> You're going to stay in the same spot. So that's when we'll troll. So we'll talk about that. And then that autopilot, uh, for people that don't know, a lot of the modern trolling motors, the power drive, and Tarolas, they all have a feature called autopilot where I point it that way, I hit a button, and I turn around and I can watch my rods. It'll just go for miles in a straight line following the GPS track. So autopilot is a great feature when, when we are trolling. Alright, um, talk about some rod holders because when I say a 33 or 45 degree rod holder, that's a rod holder that sticks up on the side of the boat 
at 33 or 45 degrees. So it's either like this or like that. Okay, and that holds the rod and tips up so that you can watch the tip. We'll talk about that when we get to the ridge. But it's important that you have something in the boat to firmly hold the rod. Okay. Uh, fish finder with GPS capabilities. You don't have to have it, but the GPS part will tell you how fast you're drifting. And the speed is key. I'll really dwell on that here a little bit. But if I can emphasize anything, it's knowing how fast you're drifting is the number one factor, whether you'll catch fish or not catch fish. Because if you're going one tenth of a mile an hour too fast, you might not catch any fish. It's that simple. All right, last thing we'll talk about are drift side or buckets. Does anybody know what a drift bucket is? Everybody uses a drift bucket. Take a five gallon bucket, you put it behind your boat, you fill it full of holes, and it slows you down. Or if you're anchored in the river, it helps keep the back of the boat from swaying when the wind blows sideways. Also, we use a drift sock. This is a drift sock, which you'll notice is it looks like a funnel. It's got a little, this is a 36 inch drift sock. Okay. It's got a little harness here. And we clip it to the boat. And we'll do two of them one on the nose and one on the tail of the boat so that we get a perfectly side drift. Okay. Anyway, what it does is it catches all that water and it slows you down. It's like a brake as you're drifting across the water. Great tool. We'll get into a little bit more on it. All right, moving on. Let's talk about rods. Any typical medium action rod, anything that you would use for channel cats, and let me clarify, we're talking about channel cats here, but if you're in lakes that have blues, obviously you're going to maybe possibly use a little heavier rod than that. You can use the same thing drifting for blues. Uh, we catch flatheads sometimes when we're doing this in lakes. Uh, we don't have a lot of flatheads in our lakes, uh, but we do catch them every so often. You can use the same technique possibly on the Ohio River in the summer when there's hardly any current. It's almost like a lake. Uh, need a, a reel with a good smooth drag. Uh, a lot of times these fish will hit, they'll carry the rod and they'll be pulling drag. You know, when you're pulling drag, you know you got a good fish. So you, know, you don't want them to, to break off because they pull, pull the hook out because you've got a sticky drag. We typically use 15 to 20 pound line. Um, line of your choice, we do like high vis lines. Uh, we use a lot of ambitious lines. We like monofilament over the grade. Uh, we're still working on that. Um, I think the monofilament has a little more stretch and it can get better hook sets when we're driving. That's still a pretty good. Some days it's better on the gray, and some days it's better on the mono, but overall I, we, we prefer the mono. Um, we're using circle hooks, so these fish hook themselves when they grab the bait and they pull against the rod, which is fixed at 45 degrees, so they're fighting the bend of the rod. Um, I'll talk about size 3 out, 5 out, and 7 out will pretty much cover all, all the branches of our channel catfish. <coughs> The equipment that we use personally, we use B&M 7'6", one piece bumper rods. Um, I prefer the Abu 6500 reels. Ryan here likes the Puma uh, Akina 400 reels. They're about the same thing, just a different company's version of the same thing. Uh, we split it with Vicious Hibis 20 pound line, and we use the, a lot of the DMG D85 circle hooks for the tech. Um, all the circle hooks will work. Uh, that we got to the, the mustads, the jingle claws, the law work. Find one that you have faith in. That's, that's the most important part. You know, the hook you have faith in is the one that will catch you the most fish. All right, moving on. Okay, so we're going to talk about the rig that we use. These are just some simple little walking sailors that we come up with. Um, what we do is, as you can see here, All right, so those are quarter ounce weights. So typically what we'll do is we'll take a piece of uh, eight or kind of 
maybe 10 or 15 pound mono, about a foot long. I'll put a bead right in the middle, I'll fold it in half, and I'll put a bunch of quarter ounce egg sinkers and just slide them on there. So that the, the end result is about six, seven, eight inches long. Typically we use four or five. So we end up with an ounce or an ounce and a quarter. That's plenty of that's perfect weight. And uh, you'll you see, I have two different variations. I have a swivel tied to the top on one. And on the other one I have, that's what's called the sinker slide. Which you guys probably know what a sinker slide is, but anyway, what it allows, to show it here, I got a rod up here, but it allows that weight to, to slide free as it slides up and down. Okay, all right, next slide. All right, so we'll talk about this and then uh, I'll go to the next picture which shows the rig. Uh, the hook rig, we use a paint float. Usually a two inch paint float is good. You can buy those at Walmart, three pack for $1.27 or something like that. Uh, you can get a one size smaller hook, or I'm sorry, one size smaller float, but the two inch float is pretty much the standard that we use for our channel. If you're fishing for blues and maybe bigger baits, or, or in a lake where you might get some blues, you, know, you might go to a two and a half or three inch paint float to keep those up. All right, and again, we use a combination of three, five, and seven hour circle hooks. Um, our leader is typically a 30 to 50 pound leader, and we'll talk about that, but the reason that we're using that, that heavy line is for the stiffness so that the rig doesn't crumple and snag on itself. Okay? Um, a couple different knots that we use. We talk about a dropper knot or a double overhand. We'll talk about that when you see the rig. If you don't know how to snell a hook, you should learn. You can go to YouTube, there's a million videos on doing snells. But it's a, it's a great way to you know, keep a, a hook perfectly straight on your lead. Um, I use a lot of improved clinch you know, I use that knot, that's my everything knot. Everybody's got an everything knot that they use, right? Improved clinch knot I use, works great, don't have any problem with it. All right, so the next picture shows the rig. <coughs> It's a little fuzzy when you blow it way up. Okay, on the left side, you see that line goes off the page there. That goes to your reel. Ryan here showed you. Okay, and then we have our weight system right there. And I have a swivel. Now when I tie this leader, it's about 30 inches of monofilament to start with. And then I tie a couple knots in here. The whole thing ends up being about 22, 26 inches long. Now, we, you can adjust that, but that's kind of my basic rig. And the key here is, you see I have a, a dropper knot, or you can just tie a double overhand knot, and cinch it tight where you have a loop about this long. And that's where that first hook is. Now, all the time, that particular hook is going to be dragging right behind that sinker. That sinker is cutting through the mud like a big crawdad or something. It's making a mud trail as it goes. And that's key. Just fish key in on that. All right? And then that hook is right behind that, that mud trail. Now, you'll notice behind that, right, they got about 15 inches of line goes to that bait float. And then I have another hook. All right. So what you end up with is you end up with a hook that's right near the bottom and you end up with one that if your leader is you know two feet long it's going to ride up about half that distance because it'll, it'll, it'll go through the water like this at about 45 degrees so it'll be up about a foot now some days we catch fish on the boat hook when fish are active you get it you know you get you know some on the bottom hook and some on the top hook other days like if i'm fishing this time of year in cold water guess what 95% of my fish are coming on that bottom hook because those fish are right on the bottom. Their bellies are all muddy, right? You caught fish where their bellies are muddy. You play tic-tac-toe on it. <clears throat> but uh, other times, you know, that upper hook, when they're really active, like in the summer, you'll catch most of your fish on the upper one because they're a foot and a half up off the bottom and they're looking for food. Um, so a couple benefits is you cover both angles. Another benefit is 
you end up two pieces of the main and twice the scent trail. That's important. And your scent trail is a little, it's not just right on the bottom, it's up a foot and a half too. So you know, your scent trail is much bigger. And the scent trail is key here because, the, you know, as you're dragging across the lake, those fish are kind of swimming across, they find the scent trail, they turn and they follow it, they'll catch up to it. And that's where going too fast can get you in a lot of trouble. Alright, another benefit, let's say you, you get a bite and, and, and he doesn't get hooked. You know, and, Get these little fish that is bad. Okay. They won't take it, they won't get hooked. And you're like, come on, take a little harder, take a little harder, and they'll, they'll follow you for a mile across the lake. And never take it. In the meantime, they're chewing on that bait before long, that bait's gone. Well, guess what? You still got another bait in the air, and that's important too. Now, another benefit is that you know, every other time, every third time we go out, we'll get a double and we'll catch two channels at the same time. Usually that's small fish, but uh, one time was like last fall I got a nine and an eight pounder at the same time we thought I had a big flag. It was two really nice channel things. So it's a great rig, and when you get two on there, it's really cool. It's like, I got another one. So, all right, let's go to the next slide. Talk about rigging and baits. This is kind of a crude picture, but what I did is I got my hand in there for reference. Okay. Now we'll talk about if I'm fishing a lake that is loaded with, you know, 12 to 14 inch channel, uh, if you fish a lot of lakes, you'll figure out what the average size fish is on the lake pretty quick. And I always start small. When we tournament fish, I'm the guy that starts small. Ryan is go big or go home. You know, he's the guy that throws the giant head there you know, on the left. Or, or I start with the smaller ones. It all leads to more numbers of fish to get more fish. He's looking for the big guy. So it's a combination that we do. In Ohio, we're allowed two rods per person. Uh, so, you know, in our tournaments, we'll have four rods, and we'll have all sorts of different things going on. And we'll talk about that a little bit, too, as we have different variations of the same rig. But what you'll see here in the lower right-hand corner, you can see the first piece, as I cut the shad, as I cut off part of the tail, because there's no blood in that, and then we just throw that out. So what I've done is I've taken this medium-sized shad, you know, I make the first cut, and I'm just going to cut the tail. Then I end up with uh, kind of the neck of the tail piece, and I'll cut that, and you'll see that the strip on the bottom right is the smallest piece. That's on about a three-aught hook. Three-aught's pretty small. That's for those little guys. If you're in a lake that's loaded with little channels, you know, I'll, I'll fish mostly three-aught hooks. But we don't like those little guys. We like the big ones. So, but anyway, what I do is when I cut that piece, then I turn it on its side and I cut it in half. So it's kind of half moon shaped. And then I just run the hook right through the, the collar of it. Can you guys see how that is set up? Those hooks are all pointing straight down. But anyway, that allows that strip to be pulled through the water and not give you line twist. Right? And that's key too. Because if you put two big heads on there, that upper one by the float, when you reel it in, you're going to have all sorts of line twists. You can do it, and we do it a lot. And sometimes we'll put a, a, a chain swivel in there just, just if we're fishing big baits with heads. Because those heads tend to spin as you pull them. That'll give you line twist. But if you just use this type of rig here, you'll be in good shape. All right, so the next one over is a five odd hook. And you'll see that that strip is about one finger wide, you kind of have huge hands or anything, but it gives you a reference. Uh, maybe about the width, about one inch wide, about the size of your thumb. And you know what, that doesn't look like a very big bait. I catch lots of 10 to 15 pound channels on little baits. So the channels, they're opportunistic. They'll grab it, whatever. You'll have no problem. The next bait is, a set, is on a seven odd hook, seven or eight odd hook. And you'll notice that's about you know, two fingers wide. So maybe even three fingers. We'll, we'll fish big baits, especially late in the tournament, but maybe I've got a bunch of five pounders and I'm looking for a five pounder bigger fish. You know, you know the bait the size of three fingers is nothing for a you know, six pound fish. The hand is there for reference. And uh, you'll notice the, the last piece is the head. We just run the hook right through the eyes. And it'll stay on there for one or two fish sometimes. Uh, I'm one of those people, if, if I catch a fish and the bait's still good, I'll leave that bait on. And I have this thing where you know, 
caught one fish, he'll probably catch some more. All right, so we talked about boat control. So remember, you're going to go upwind to a spot. You can go anywhere out on the lake and start and just start drifting. And as that boat's drifting, these are the water temps. Again, this is where your fish finder, you know, fancy fish finder with the GPS will really lock in and help you. You'll notice early in the spring, so that's starting here about now. And that water, 36, 41 degrees right in that area. Okay, that's a 0.2 to 0.3 miles per hour. If you go 0.4, you're not going to catch anything this time of year. And just uh, those fish are right on the bottom. And, you know, they're hunkered down up there. They're not going to chase a bait. If you hit them in the nose, they'll eat them. And you got one shot, and then grab it. And that's where, if you have too big a bait, where they have, where a little fish grabs that big bait, and you know, he's not going to get hooked, and he's not going to chase it. So if you're going too fast, or this time of year, you get one quick whack, and either they're hooked or they're not, because they're just not going to chase it. So you can catch them all week long. We were out two weeks ago in 37 degree water. Uh, we got some fish. I got a picture of one of them. Ryan got a nice 12 pound. You know, as the water warms up, 42 to 48 degrees, um, 0.4 is a good target speed. Now you can always go a little slower. That's okay. But if you go too much faster, than that, you're just going to get nothing. <laughs> that that key. If you're going too fast, the fish will grab the bait but not get the hook, and so you'll get that real quick and you'll be like, how did that fish not get hooked? Because he didn't get it. And then you're like, well, you're waiting for it to come back and hit it again, and they, don't, they just never come back. That tells you that you're going too fast. you got to slow it down. That's where this speed is crucial for you to have a successful day. All right, as water temps warm up, 49 to 60, you know, 0.5 is good. Get in the summer, you know, all the way up to maybe 85 degrees, those fish, you could, you could be going two miles an hour and there will be days when you'll catch all sorts of fish. So when they're really active, they'll chase and they'll, they'll you know, once they find the bait, they're not leaving until they get it or you reel it out and <laughs> Those are the great days. And, th and that's really when you get your numbers because those fish are super active. All right, now you'll notice, here's one key point. See where I say above 85 degrees? I've got it at 0 .5. 0 0.5 is a great speed to just target. I mean, if, if every day you did 0.5, you're pretty close to where you need to be. Because when that water gets super hot, and I mean, we, we, we fish in so many shallow lakes, water be 92, 93 degrees, creates bath water. And when it's that warm, they lose being active, and they start to settle back down, and they, they won't chase real hard. So there's a point where it gets too hot, and you have to slow back down a little bit. 0.5 is a great target speed for anglers. In the fall, you know, as the water is slowly falling from 60 to about you know, 46, again, they're active. No problem there. Uh, 0.5, 0.8, even 1.0. You know, you get a big gust of wind, it'll push you a little faster for a little bit, and you'll see your GPS speed go up to 1.0. You'll still catch fish. So that's not a problem. But as water gets below 45 in the fall, you gotta start slowing down. Yeah, they're feeding, and they'll hit you again. But again, they're not gonna chase so hard. They're opportunistic feeders. So, you know, at some point, it's going too fast away from them. They're not gonna waste that much energy. They know they gotta feed, but they have to conserve energy for winter. All right? As I get down to that early winter, that 40 to 38, you can still get away with about 0.3, maybe even 0.4. Because those fish are being active all summer, so as the water gets colder in the fall, they're more active at that same temperature than they are in the spring, where they've been dormant all all winter. It takes longer. Plus, the other thing is, you know, you may go out a day like today, the sun's out. You know, you're getting a surface temp of say, you know, whatever, 43 degrees, but really, it's not 43 degrees down the bottom. You know, it's still cold. So that's why the speed in the fall, you can get away with going faster in the fall than you came in the spring for the same speed. And, that, and that's crucial to know. I talk about like after first ice, once water gets below 37 degrees, 
and you pretty much got a snap. Point two, you feel like you're barely moving. If you can catch a fish, I'm fine. Uh, I do a ton of ice fishing. We catch channels all winter long. Like, you know, they're feeding, you know, but they're close to the bottom. They're always within six inches of the bottom. And that's where, you know, uh, on that rig, you'll catch most of your fish on that lower rig, closest to the bottom. You know, it takes longer for them to become active after being dormant for the winter, but they stay active at fuller tents in the fall. So hopefully you can understand that. All right, let's go. All right, drift speed. <clears throat> that one, there you go, perfect, thank you. Drift speed. We talked about, you can use different size drift socks. That one we held up is 36 inches. That's a standard one. Uh, I have a 19 foot boat, um, three at the bottom. It's a deep V, so it's got high sides, so the wind catches it. Anyway, uh, the wind is not friendly to me. <clears throat> um, I use a combination of three 36 inches and two 60 inch. The ones we use are the Cabela's Advanced Anchor Drift Socks. They're great. They have, they have a little weight on the bottom and they have a little float on the top. And that keeps your drift sock from sinking in the water column. And you guys can look at this right afterwards, or in the end, I'll have that. But anyway, we use a combination. So basically, what happens is when I use a combination of two huge socks and these three little ones, you know, I'll start with two little ones, then I'll add that third little one in the middle of the boat. And one thing I do is they come with little flips. I replace this little clip right here and just go to Harbor Freight and get these big clips. These will fit over half inch rod holders. And uh, so I'll clip them right to the bottom of the rod holders on the side of the boat. Or they'll go into your cleats, right? The center section of the cleat with that little clip on. So that's, that's a little tip there. But anyway, I can come up with about eight different speeds. So if the wind's blowing at 25 miles an hour, they're white caps, and blowing us like crazy. I put all five of those drift socks out, I can get down to 0.4, 0.3. So it looks like you're hardly moving. So, uh, but at a minimum, if, you, if you're serious about it, get two drift socks, get two of the 30 inch, and then that'll cover the majority of keeping you nice and solid. All right, let's move on. Okay, controlling versus drifting. So we talked about when the water is flat, looks like glass. Hey, we're trolling, so what do we do? I put four rods up the back of the boat, as you can see in the picture, spread them out. We use uh, longer rods on the outside. We use 10 foot rods sometimes, so we can get the rods out further and spread out. And that's with a four rod spread. Um, and then we put that trolling motor, and I can adjust the speed going into the rhythm. Sometimes, if it's flat, sometimes you can put a drift sock out the back and you control it this way, and that gives you a more constant speed. But sometimes, if you're trolling and it's flat, if a gust of wind comes from behind you, you know, especially about 9, 30, 10 in the morning as wind starts to pick up for the day, all of a sudden it'll start pushing you a little faster than you think you should go. So then you can put a drift sock back to slow you down here and then control it over. Control drifting, and all that. But again, I can just adjust my speed based on the setting on the track. And that's important for you to control the speed. Uh, we talked about planer boards. Everybody knows like, the walleye guys all planer boards to control with. We use them all the time. We put them on outside rods. And the only difference to the rig is you go to a slightly less weight. Basically, I uh, cast the rod out you know, whatever, 40 feet, and then I clip the planer board on, and they're pretty simple. I can show the people afterwards. And then just let out some more line, and that planer board will pull those lines out of the boat. And that just gives you a bigger story. Because again, it's all about the covering water to find the good fish to Okay, now we talked about long rods. Long rods, and use 10 footers a lot. Okay, when and where? So typically, in every lake, you're going to have mud flats. Mud flats are great, especially this time of year, because that's where the fish are at. All through the summer, they'll sit on mud flats. I'm a channel cat. I'm through up. 
drop around on these mud flats because that's where the majority the majority of lakes are mud flats because water comes in, and it comes in muddy and high water, and then that mud settles. So it always mud. Maybe you've got weeds growing and all that. So I don't know, we do a lot of mud flats in the mud in the shallow water early in the year as fish are moving up in the fish pond. Mud flats warm up first. And at the upper end of the lake, so if you get more of the water, you slowly get the fish to become more Same gravel bottoms. So <laughs> even though you got mud flats across these big vast areas of your local lake, they're trust me, they're gravel bottoms. And as as you are drifting, you know, your rods are slowly just sort of you know grow, you know, slowly bending this you know, <coughs> current strain on it. But if everything's slow, you know, and you're waiting for that hit. But if you're drifting and your rod is like tick, 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 you can tell. You just put your hand on the rod, especially if you're fishing a braid, you can feel those rocks. You can feel the weight hitting the rocks. So you, you, know, you need to make a note and put a GPS mark on those kind of spots because wherever those gravel waters like that, I'll always fish all of this. Pretty much your mind. Creek channels are great. The reason creek channels are great is because when they made that lake, there's all sorts of stumps along the edge of the creeks where they cut trees down or they left trees standing either way. But those creek channels are great because you know it's been 10 foot of water and then in the creek channel it might be 15 foot of water. Those are free woods. So as the lake goes up and down, there's cover and structure there. So what we'll do is a lot of times we'll drift across a creek channel. And these snags are relatively, or I'm sorry, these rigs are relatively snagless because of that six or eight inch sinker that let it hop over little sticks and all sorts of stuff. It's a smaller version of the that they were using right in time. He's using that in the rivers where you've got logs this big, so it hops over a log. In my legs, I don't have logs this big. I have little logs and sticks. So that's the difference I've just done. Uh, Windblown banks are, are great for channel cats. If, if, you know, if there's a huge uh, southwest wind, I'm going to go to the northeast <coughs> corner and I'm run along that bank because shad and everything gets pushed up there. If you don't think that's true, you always hear about bass guys talking about that. Uh, channel cats are just like that. They're predatory people. And wherever the wind's blown, those fish are on those points. They're on those banks. So that's a great, great tip for you. Final points. Um, when I get to the next slide, I'll talk about that. Uh, ledges are great. Anywhere you have a ledge, a lot of times in these flood control lakes, all this mud comes in and it's slowly filling the lake up. The lake bottom slowly getting filled up. And at some point, there's a ledge where the mud stops and gravel starts. If you can find where that ledge is, it may be a one foot drop, you know, where it's slowly filling in the lake. That's a great area. Fish will always sit on those ledges. Okay, next picture. This is just a typical topographic map of the lake. See in the top center how there is a bridge? That's a funnel point. So if you have high water coming in, say on that creek arm, you know, you're gonna have current right through that, right through that bridge channel. So where there's current, there's figure. So you know, you can troll, say drift, just troll right up through those channels. That's a great spot because anywhere fresh creeks or rivers are coming in, that spreads food and channel gas. All right, next picture. All right, some tips to go through. High vis line is great. If I throw four, four lines out the back of the boat, or maybe I got a third person in the boat, we got six across the side, we're pretty crowded. You know, it's, you know, it's 18 inches between each rock. High vis line lets you see where the lines are out in the water. So that way, you know, if I catch one in the middle of my head, I reel it in, or whatever the case, you know, I got a small pocket to cast to. So what we typically do is, and this is another trick where I talk about uh, casting on the swing, I'll just move these two, maybe uh, these other rods over, and I'll cast out at 45 degrees and let that bait swing in. This helps us catch a ton of fish because it takes our scent trail, which it was once foot wide right down the lake, and now there's a little spur over here. You know, now it's 100 foot wide as that scent trail comes in and falls. And the walleye guys, many of you 
guys ever get an all in trouble. Right? Uh, drifting from wall I A lot of our guys locally, fish like Erie, do this. They've been doing this for years. They've figured out they catch a lot of fish that way. And it puts you into fish that you just didn't drift over with a boat. Now, typically not line shot, but it seems like we get into a lot of big fish. It makes you wonder if maybe they are in that line shot, a boat shot, your boat goes right over and your partner you know, drops his can't pop on the bottom of the boat. At all. Uh, we talk about rattles and spinners. All right, so uh, on the rig, you can buy rattles. You can use, instead of a pay float, you can buy Mr. Crappie rattle floats. We've tried all of them. There's a time and place for both rattles and almost uh, spinner rigs that look a lot like the walleye inline spinner rigs when they're uh, trolling and uh, marks. There's a time and place we've had some great days with them and had other days where they don't do any better. So if we're fishing four rods, one of them's always got some sort of spinner on it. One of them's always got a rattle on it. And trust me, about, about the third time Ryan's rattle rod catches a fish and I got nothing on it, I'm on it. As tournament guys, we're always, you know, whatever you're doing is working, I'm going to switch mine to that. You know, the quicker we figure out that pattern, the quicker everybody's catching the fish, and that's, that's the whole goal here, right? All right, we talk about zigzag. If I'm trolling, you know, I'll hit the troll motor and I'll make a little turn. So if I make a turn or a gradual turn, what that does is those outside rods, as I'm turning, the inside rod starts going slower than it was going. The outside rod goes faster than it was going. So zigging and zagging speeds up and slows down your baits. It's great to catch a ton of fish on the zig or the zag, as we call it. Uh, if you've got a good wind, you can drift down. Let's say you find an area. You may be going across a lake for half a mile, but hit a 200-yard spot where you caught five fish. And then all of a sudden, then there's nothing out there. So you come back and then turn around and troll right up front and go right through the same area. And then, and then once you get through that area, you can turn the boat sideways, and, uh, turn off the trolling motor, pull the whip box out, and drift right back through again, and you just keep doing it. Uh, trying to be efficient on your time, that's, that's a great tip. Uh, talk about long leaders. Okay, so our typical rig is about this long. In the summer, uh, one of us will run leaders this long because that float on that on that longer leader is now two or three feet off the bottom instead of one foot off the bottom. And we mix it up and try to try to cover different water columns. And that's a good tip. Uh, bounce versus drag. Typically, if I cast out, you know, uh, you know, 40 feet water's 10 foot deep, you know, I've got a pretty consistent angle of drop for the line. And as the boat is moving, it's dragging the bait. Well, if I shorten that to 20 foot and it's right on the bottom here, and the line is almost straight down. As the boat is rocking with the wind blowing, I'm bouncing that way instead of dragging that way. Sometimes that can be, we've had days where it seems like when it's super windy and there's white caps, and, you know, that boat is rocking sideways like crazy, like the, the drift socks, you know, you're jerking the bait. You're not dragging the bait consistently, you're jerking it, so we call it bouncing the bait. Well, that can trigger fish in that. And so when you get hits where you jerk it and the fish grabs it, and then you go to jerk it, Pretty much sets the for you anyway. And at that point, you know, we get violent hits. <laughs> the boat is really rocking a little bit. Because the fish will come in and grab it, and then he stays there and then he hit him. Alright, so that's what we talked about back. Bouncing versus dragging. So if we're running four lines out, we'll run two of them short, you know, one long, one short, one long, one short. Just very mixed things up. Net scales rule. Three things that every person should have in their boat, especially there's a lot of slot limits right now in a lot of states. I know in Ohio you're allowed uh, 
we have official Iowa award uh, for channels over 26 inches and I guess 25 or 30 inches fish over here. Just catch a ton of good fish. So it's always nice to know how long they are. Uh, net is always important to have a good net. We like nets that have that tiny fish net uh, rubber coated in the basket. That way when we scoop the fish, the, the sinkers and the hooks don't fall through the net. So that makes it easier to unhook the fish and get a rock right back out when we're turning. Scales, everybody should have scales. There's nothing worse than some idiot on Facebook holding up a you know, channel catch as big and telling me he's 18 pounds. Right? Okay, for Christmas, all your friends are going to pass a hat and buy this guy a scale. We all have people like it. We all go. Alright, camera, camera's great. Gotta take pictures. Um, catch photo release. You know, we're all about, you know, people want to keep some channels to eat. That's great. Within your limit. I typically tell friends of mine that, that do that. They come with me. They're like, hey, I want to catch some channel cats to eat. So I have a couple lakes that are nice and clean. The fish really look good. You know, uh, typically less than about four pounds. I'll let them keep anything bigger than that. Bigger than that. We've watched in some of our favorite lakes the size of fish get bigger each year because we're letting them go. We see that. All right. Here's talk two stories about, about these two pictures here. On the left, uh, that's me and uh, Vince Nadosky. Uh, this was years ago, one of the first days we had, one of the best days I've had today. We were in a tournament up at Clear Fork Lake up in uh, North Central Ohio. And uh, we had never been on lake. So we're sitting there at uh, the start of the tournament. Everybody takes off and we're like, Oh, where do you want to go? Oh, I don't know. Thank you. So I went to the lake map because we're going <laughs> And I'm like, oh, here's a, here's a spot. Little Creek Channel comes right up behind an island. For what? 100 yards from right. Everybody's gone. And we're like, oh. And in terms of that, everybody watches where we're going to fish. So we go there, start drifting. And I don't know. I bet we caught five or 600 pounds of fish. And we're watching everybody else moving all over the place. Going left over there, all these people that have been kicking our butts for years. And we're like, huh, that's weird. And we figured everybody was whacking the fish. And it turns out we were the only ones that did it. The fish on the left looks small, that's 12 pounder. The one on the right is like still to today, my personal best, that's a 18 and a quarter pound champ. So it just goes to show you that you know you don't have to leave far from the rain to do well. Yeah. Just kind of a good story there. This other tournament was uh, this past spring, one year ago. Uh, again, it's being left. Uh, Vince Nagoski was Ryan that was out of town for something. I don't know why. And uh, I ended up fishing in Vince's boat. That's his brother on the right. A good note is his brother on the right, Bill, is legally blind. And this comes into play because when we got started, we started drifting, and I had brought my drift socks. Vince doesn't have any drift socks. I knew it was early in the year, it was hard for that. We were going to have to go slow. So, we started going, and his brother Bill was like, oh, you know, he broke off a rig, and I said, here, use one of my rigs. So we to Turns out, me and Bill caught like 10 channels. We won this tournament. Vince never had a bite because he had a one hook rig behind a float, and we caught every fish not on the float. Close to the bottom. So that's where that two hook rig comes into play and can make all the difference. Of course, Vince didn't have any problems sharing the proceeds of us doing that trade. Right. There we go. Alright, next slide. Just some photos. This photo on the left, Ryan, that's a 12 pound channel that uh, Ryan thought was the week and a half ago. Not far from here. Um, these are just, I don't know, these are all 12 to I think 15 pounders. It's me on this one on the right. Next photo. It's a nice, beautiful, clean uh, channel there on the left, Ryan caught. That's actually from C.J. Brown, so you guys may know that very well. This is a 14 and a quarter pounder here on the right out of Cecil's Creek Lake. That's not too far from here. Two hours straight on Ohio's musky lakes. And go ahead, next one. Um, that's another big belly. I think that was a 14 pounder Ryan caught. This is a tournament we won here. <laughs> Uh, four nice fish there. One of those I think was 14 pounds. 
but I think all four of those were over 10 pounds. So, all right, next one. All right, questions. All right, we'll take some questions. How are we doing on time? All right, it's pretty close. Any questions? We'll be at the B&M booth back here. Uh, it's in the back right corner back there. Feel free to stop by. We can get in more detail. Um, me and Ryan both can be found on, on Facebook. Um, if you come back there, if anybody wants me, I can email you this presentation with those couple charts. Feel free to just come back and give me your email. With that, I thank everybody for their time. I thank Steve and Jeff Jones for uh, hooking us up. It's been a great event. So with that, uh, you know, that fish is ready to go. They don't stop all, all winter long. So if you haven't been out yet, I'd be making plans right now. I'd be fishing today right now. <laughs> all right, thank you for your time.